Good day, mate. 40 here. I was just reading The Atlantic magazine this morning and had an article on Christianity that grabbed my attention. So it uh, talks about a less religious America is a more polarized America. So in some times and places and circumstances, right, more Christianity will lead to a more polarized situation. Other times and circumstances and places, less Christianity will lead to a more polarized situation. But uh, this particular professor, Daniel Williams, writes in The Atlantic today that uh, a less religious America, a less Christian America will be a more polarized America and that declines in church attendance have made the rural Republican regions of the country even more Republican and even more stridently Christian nationalist. So about half of Christian nationalists, according to this article, virtually never go to church. Right, the wave of states bending during their affirming care this year, the adoption of proud Christian nationalists as an identity by politicians such as Marjorie Taylor Greene, even markets t-shirts with that slogan. It's not what many people might have expected at a time when church attendance is declining. So for many people, Christianity is simply a way of expressing their identity. It says, you know, who I am, where my loyalties lie. It doesn't actually mean church attendance. So with people like uh, Nick Fuentes and a lot of other people on the distant right, uh, Christianity is a much more attractive marker for the type of politics that they want to pursue than something that is more explicit, say, a racial nationalism going on. So people hold on to their politics when they stop attending church. Liberal Christians in the Northeast, they stay liberal when they drop off their church's membership roles. Conservative Christians in Alabama and Indiana stay conservative even when they're no longer part of a congregation. In fact, people become even more entrenched in their political views when they stop attending church services. So churches have a reputation in some circles as promoting hyper-politicization, but they can also be depolarizing institutions because being part of a religious community, it forces you to get along with other people, including those with different political views, and it will often channel your efforts into charitable work or forms of leadership or volunteering within the church that have little to do with politics. When you leave the church community, that removes often those moderating forces, and it opens the door to more extreme forms of uh, politics and nationalism. So Christian nationalism attracts at least 50% of the adherents to Christian nationalism almost never go to church themselves. And so without church community, which in many cases has acted as a moderating effect on people's politics, uh, politics has become much more extreme. Okay, we've got a clip here from Gavin McGuinness and uh, Anthony Camilla. What the left doesn't understand about race relations. Just do understand about racism. The whole like one drop thing. Yeah which is that it's the basis for oh, American okay. racism. Mm -hmm. And it's why we're talking about it every day in America. It's based on the one drop theory, which is Kamala Harris, Salman Rushdie, Ben Carson, ghetto blacks like K, what's his name, in um, the South Bronx, K Flock, who just killed someone in a rival housing ben project. Ben Carson. Oops. They're all the same to racists. Yeah. <clears throat> right, right. So same the reason Kamala Harris is a black VP, even though her formative years were spent in Montreal and her mother's Indian and her black dad was around, and even her black dad was a plantation owner, his, his family owned slaves. It's hilarious. The reason those people can all pretend to be fucking young Wayne, whatever his name is, Lil Wayne, is because dyed in the wool racists follow the one drop theory. Yeah. But the problem with that theory is, and it's a theory, yeah. and it's it's the backbone of American discourse today. Uh -huh. No one thinks that. No one really thinks. Like, I mean, like I'm sure there's 17 a few people, right. 17 people in yeah. Mobile, Alabama. There might be an old 90 year old man. Yeah. Who you bring over Kamala Harris, and he's oh, in yeah. his chair, and he, he looks like he's from Tales from the Crypt. Yeah, yeah. He's like, well, looky here. And you're like, Dad, she's a lawyer. Oh my god. Or sorry, great granddad. Yeah. <laughs> she's a lawyer. She 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 went to school in Montreal. She's the vice president of the United States. <laughs> I don't care who the fuck I'm coming to this guy. Meanwhile, he talks black. Right, right. I don't understand. <laughs> I think it's the Southern accent. Yeah, it's the Southern accent. You know, they have a lot in common. So we've all been lumped in with that dude in the chair. Yeah. And it's like, that's illogical. We're just trying to have racial discussions. Right. And point out things that are happening. And, you know, uh, some things are very bad and they need to be pointed out. But, uh, yeah, we're not like, we don't see, we don't see Kamala Harris and, or Neil deGrasse Tyson and be like, well, looky here. Looky here. Someone thinks he's an astrophysicist. You got us one of them high for loot. We will, will. Look at you with your stars in the sky. <laughs> Tell you what, I'd like to put you in a rocket and send you the fuck <laughs> off to Mars, boy! So we've all been lumped into this thing, and all these black aristocrats can say, like, yes, I know that I'm, I'm with you. I went to Eton. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, I'm treated by the masses like a common, everyday thug. And you're <laughs> yeah, like, no, yeah. you're no, not. No, you're not. That's a lie. You're really not. I got, I got off the train today, walking up from Penn Station, and then 
Seventh Avenue, which is a fucking nightmare. That block is getting worse and worse. I have to dodge, stick, and move. I'm going. There's that one in the wheelchair. The crowd. Are you talking about right here? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah right here. Brutal. And then there's drug dealers. There's people that are just this one woman. She's disgusting, and she's eating something out of one of those cardboard things like you get French fries in, but it was some form of it's meat. not French fries. No, and, and then she goes. It's oh, like it's ham it's she found, <laughs> and spits this oh. bone with meat on it. Dude, I'm like, I'm going over selfies. I'm like, I don't think I can eat. I think she just fucked my whole eating. Up, I can't. So I'm just looking at. And then there was this gentleman, a black dude. Oh, African American. Suit, tie, nice, uh, uh, short hair, his own. It wasn't funny. And you said, You're just as bad as her. Exactly. Because you got the same drop, yeah, motherfucker. Yeah. One drop, motherfucker. I don't, you think you're special? You ain't special, motherfucker. He's got like a, a not a briefcase, but like a portfolio thing. Yeah. He's walking. Full of crack. Walking down. Crack. <laughs> and I thought that. I just thought, like, There you go. It's that easy. It's that easy. Just. And I'm not talking everyone has to have the suit and tie and the thing. But don't be that. There's a lot in between right. that and that. Yeah. Just try to be more than halfway. I guarantee you, that. if there was a young, a young liberal, like a 28-year-old liberal at NYU, and he sat down with you, me, and a 66-year-old black man <laughs> from Harlem. <laughs> oh, it shit. would be us three. Oh, yeah. Just going, what the fuck did you just say? Yeah, yeah. We... Listen, motherfucker. Yeah. This is the way it goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the old black dude would be just as uh, upset with the way things are going. <laughs> yeah. That's a great synonym for racist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just just as upset. I'm not racist, I'm upset. That's a t-shirt. I'm, I'm not racist, I'm upset. I'm upset. Oh, no. I hear Gino's already got it up on his side. Shit! Fuck this guy. Fat. He's fat. Always. No, when I was coming here, this is a white woman. Uh, liberals, she'll be happy to hear. Um, <laughs> last show, last week, I was coming up the stairs, and this is on my getter, because I'm not on Twitter, um, and there was a yes. woman who had just been vomiting all over the stairs. So she's lying there, her tits are hanging out, she has piercings through her tit. Holy shit. And she's just, she's got a dollar bill in her hand. Did she make Chrissy Mayer's show <laughs> that day? Because she was supposed to. <laughs> and she's just like, she's leaned up over the stairs and just been like. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to spit. <laughs> got out of your sinuses. And then she's like, I got to hit the hay, boys. This is this is heroin is strong. Oh, shit. And she just lay there with her crumpled up $1 bill and her fucking cornmeal. Oh, I lie. With her Ugh. little tits hanging out with piercings through them. Whoa. It's like, this is... Jafaka? <laughs> her pussy tasted so disgusting. It was just, I got a heroin buzz off of It was, it was urine. The, the urine had soaked into the pubes. Oh, so as God. I'm eating around, my nose is in the pubes. Right, right. And I'm sensing the... the just urine. It's soaked it, called, it up. Uric acid? Yes. It just soaked it up. I'm inhaling that. Oh, like a sponge. God. Like a big woolly after, pillow. After about half an hour, I was like, I'm done. I'm done. I'm out of here. I can't do that. I don't care if you don't wake up. I can't do this a minute longer. And then 15 minutes right. after that, I then, then I left. Yeah, then I left. And the police were like, finally. And I'm like, mind your own fucking business. <laughs> you know okay, some uh, street talk there from Gavin, <laughs> Gavin and Andy. Okay, so how did we get to this state where people decide you know, meaning in life and, and their morality just from what happens between their ears. Like, how did we get to this referential moral state where there's just so much lack of meaning, lack of purpose in people's lives? They feel so disconnected from other people. They have you know, a reduced sense of right and wrong. And uh, perhaps the best explanation comes from a philosopher, Charles Taylor, a man of the left. He wrote a 2007 book called A Secular Age. And he talks about the contrast between the, the, mond the modern bounded self, protected, the, the buffered self, and the poorer self of the earlier, more enchanted world. So a poorer sense self means that, you know, I feel affected by everything that's going on around me, uh, whether from, you know, evil spirits to angels to sexual perversity to other forms of perversity and moral degeneration that uh, that affects me. The modern liberal sense is that we're buffered, that we can create meaning and purpose and decide right and wrong from within our own minds. And so the traditional sense of self, right, the vulnerable self, right, the source of our most powerful and important emotions, the source of meaning in life and morality is outside of us, right? It's outside of our mind. There is a clear boundary, right, for, for the modern, right? There's a clear boundary between us on the inside and what's going on outside. So I can see that boundary as a buffer. I see that things don't need to get to me. Right? There's a sense that I am a master of meanings for me. But in the traditional sense of life, meaning out exists outside of one. You can construct a good life only by conforming to the hero system of your community. So for Christian nationalists, all right, and for all sorts of other people, for, for trads in general, meaning is not something that you just decide between your two ears. Morality is not just something you decide between your two ears. It's something outside of you that you strive towards. And uh, David Brooks, Atlantic article, decries our morally inarticulate world. But what world is he thinking of? We don't 
We don't lack for moral articulation. We have all sorts of smart people articulating right and wrong all the time. What we primarily lack is social cohesion and social trust. So here are some very smart people articulating right and wrong on the Trump indictment. So the idea that he'll somehow be silenced is a fantasy. I'm Howard Kurtz, and this is Media Buzz. With a federal judge setting a March 4th trial date for the Justice Department's indictment on election interference charges, that's a day before Super Tuesday, the commentators have very mixed views. Joe Biden isn't even committing to debating Donald Trump. This isn't a battle of ideas. There's no effort at persuasion. This is the removal of a political opponent through brute force, through handcuffs and ballot gimmickry. Well, I think Dom Donald Trump is going to be the nominee because I haven't seen the willingness, the fortitude among the other uh, candidates to really take him on and make a thing out of this unprecedented um, turn of events, these four indictments, the fact that he was probably going to be in prison. Prosecutors are attempting to throw Trump in prison for interfering with an election. Well, looks like they themselves are looking to have an impact on an election, unless, of course, you believe these dates are just simply by accident and a, and a mere coincidence. I mean, if Donald Trump doesn't want to have his trial start the day before Super Tuesday, the simple solution is don't commit crimes um, so that you're facing a criminal trial. Uh, the day before Super Tuesday. Joining us now to analyze the coverage, Molly Hemingway, editor-in-chief of The Federalist and a Fox News contributor. And in San Diego, Laura Fink, head of Rebel Communications. Molly, do you agree that Donald Trump being tied up in courtrooms for weeks, well, hardly a great situation, is not going to slow his march to the nomination? Yeah, well, clearly it seems to be helping him, not just in the Republican primary, but also with the general election votes. You had the Wall Street Journal poll showing that just yesterday. And so it's not just Republicans who are more inclined to favor him, but independents and moderates as well. And the reason why is because people do not view these as legitimate prosecutions. If you're not a Democrat partisan, you tend to view this as a political prosecution that is scarier than any kind of election contest. And so it does seem to be helping. Laura, uh, the general election may well be a different story. You've got obviously much broader. Okay, so I agree with that analysis. I, I think that most of these indictments are you know, bogus. I, I think some of them stand up. But uh, I saw a comment on, on Twitter that, that grabbed my attention. All right, it's by someone named Fisher King. He says, uh, musing on the fact that no major figure went to prison following the 2008 financial crisis, Authorities took literal interpretations of statutes, said no case could be made. But to indict Trump, we are using ancient statutes, we are using RICO law designed for the mafia. When they want you, they can get very creative, they can bend the law any way they want. When they want to protect you, they say the law just isn't there, their hands are tied. Well, yeah, even objective law is always enforced and prosecuted by human beings who are subjective. But the uh, 2008 global financial crisis was not primarily caused by illegal behavior, right? It was primarily caused by the United States government mandating that banks lend to people who are manifestly unqualified to receive mortgage loans. And then when those people started defaulting on their loans, the whole system went bankrupt and the global financial system that uh, used to make bets on American mortgage uh, back securities, they were very stable until the effect of government constantly promoting loans to people with protected minority status who were manifestly not qualified to be able to pay back such loans. That's what trash the global financial system. So all sorts of bad things can happen with the consent of the law. We have a rabbinic commentator, Nachmanides, he says you can be disgusting with, with the consent of the Torah and you can be disgusting with the consent of civil law. So, in fact, our civil law has constrained police from doing their jobs. We're, we're allowing murderers out. We're allowing you know, bad people out of prison. We're not prosecuting people. And so, through legal means, we are trashing our country. Right? When terrible things happen, right, it's not necessarily because laws are being broken. Right? You can do horrible things with the consent of the law. And with the consent of the law, Donald Trump is being prosecuted in many cases on bogus 
bases. On some cases, I think some of the indictments are solid. So the third one, the one for mishandling classified documents, I think there's, there's a solid basis for that. But uh, the other indictments seem overly political, and it's amusing. The New York Times runs this big article lamenting what's going on in Bangladesh. Quietly crushing a democracy from within, millions on trial in Bangladesh. The most active rivals to the country's ruling party face dozens, even hundreds of court cases each, paralyzing the opposition as a crucial election approaches. Not a word in here about how some similar things are going on in the United States, right? where Donald Trump is being distracted by all these indictments. He has to spend a great deal of money to fight these indictments. Right? The most likely nominee from the opposition party is being crushed by lawfare. Right? So some similar things going on in Bangladesh, but no sense of irony on the part of the, the New York Times. Let's get a little bit more here from Media Buzz. Six months to the voting or so. Uh, let me play for both of you uh, what the former president said in an interview with Glenn Beck. And if you're president again, will you lock people up? The answer is you have no choice because they're doing it to us. And I never hit Biden as hard as I could have. And then I heard he was trying to indict me, and it was him that was doing it. These are sick people. These are evil people. Molly, Donald Trump and his loyalists believe these indictments are a result of the weaponization of law enforcement, and I know you agree. But when he says he has no choice if he wins back the White House but to prosecute his political opponents, are we in for an endless cycle of payback? Well, the interesting thing to do is look back at 2016, where the Republican base wanted Hillary Clinton held accountable for clear crime crimes. She had set up a private server. She destroyed tens of thousands of emails in the middle of an investigation. But when Trump won election, he explicitly said, we don't, you know, we just have to let people handle things at the ballot box. We're not going to prosecute my primary political opponent. The response was the Russia collusion hoax. Two impeachments, now 91 indictments from Democrat prosecutors up and down the eastern seaboard. The question isn't whether Republicans will be responding in some way. It'll be, it's going to be what else will they be doing to try to preserve the country and not be a place where politicized prosecutions are the order of the day for how to handle political disagreements. Well, I do have to point out that when Donald Trump says any. OK, question from the chat. Will the Trump saga end in a bang or a whimper? Well, think about how most of our lives will end. Most of our lives will not end in a bang. They'll end in a whimper. So I suspect that the Trump saga will end with a whimper. I'd, I'd put the odds at uh, 10 to 1, right? The odds are uh, more than 90 percent in my estimation that the Trump saga will end with a whimper rather than with a bank. That's just the nature of humanity. We're just incredibly vulnerable people. I would bet the odds are more than 90% that the Joe Biden era will end with a whimper rather than a bang. Very few eras end as the JFK era ends with a, with a bang rather than, than a whimper. Uh, Luke Cross says, I thought the Trump saga would be snuffed out in 2020, then January 6th happened. Yeah. There is a substantial portion of the American population who feels that Donald Trump is on their side. That Donald Trump will, will fight for them, that Donald Trump might even win for them. And even people on the left, such as Simon Cooper in the Financial Times column this, this weekend, he says if Trump is reelected, he will be a far more consequential president than he was the first time around. So conservatives have assembled about 50,000 names to take over top civil service jobs and, and bend the civil service much more in a Trumpian direction. So the first time around, Trump was largely hamstrung by, one, his own lack of abilities as a leader, two, very effective opposition springing largely from the civil service, the media, and the Democratic Party. Joe Biggs got 17 years in the big house. I bet you my left nut Trump will not pardon him. I don't think I even know who... Uh, Joe Biggs is, oh, is he one of the Proud Boy leaders? So I, I don't shed any tears for people who've gone to prison for committing crimes on January 6th. I, I would like all, all rioters to, to be punished because I believe so much in the rule of law. Back to Molly Hemingway. Media largely ignoring these posts because they don't like what he's saying. Yeah, the media are continuing their operation as co-partisans with the Democrat Party. So being able to use social media is an important aspect. But just to some of these points, yeah. the Department of Justice is also 
something that a lot of Americans view as compromised, not just because of the way that they're going against the primary Republican politician in the yes. country, but also the way that they are protecting the Biden family. This is a major issue. And actually, Joe Biden did use the New York Times on April 2nd, 2022, to funnel a message to Merrick Garland that he did want Donald Trump prosecuted. He had more than enough opportunity to claim that that was an inaccurate telling of his viewpoint, said by, of course, anonymous sources within the White House. And he didn't do that. What and did so he say? Or he said he... that he wanted his uh, primary political opponent to be handled, he wanted him to be prosecuted for, uh, and he, he's actually said a lot of stuff to that end. He said it before he was inaugurated, he said it right after he was inaugurated publicly, that he did want this to be done. It is being done. It's being done by his Department of Justice, which has is embroiled in a horrific scandal for covering up the Biden family corruption. Now, most of Donald Trump's problems are caused by Donald Trump, right? The way that Donald Trump behaved after he clearly lost the 2020 election was irresponsible, was unconscionable, was bad for the country. I think these indictments are similarly bad for the country because they'll re encourage Republicans now to retaliate and try to hamstrung and take out Democratic nominees using similar tactics. But Trump brought these troubles on himself. He, he was you know, reckless. He was childish. He was self-centered. He conducted himself with you know, little regard for the, for the greater good but also Democrat prosecutors in New York and Atlanta. And so this is a real problem. I mean, totally apart from people's personal feelings about Donald Trump, this weaponization of the Department of Justice and other law enforcement and, and, and other aspects of our judicial system is a real crisis for a lot of Americans, regardless of their political. They don't, they don't want to be in a country well, that handles disputes this way. I haven't seen it outside of uh, let deep red Republicans make that one of their top three issues, Molly, but I do understand. To parents at school board meetings. It is true that these courtrooms are going to be a scene of major campaigning, but that is because it appears that this is the main campaign strategy of Biden and the Democrats to focus on these things instead of how the economy is going, how the country is being run, how the war in Ukraine is being handled, what the border is like. It's clear that it is a campaign strategy, Laura, but I would disagree about whether that's so will uh, Joe Biden survive, presuming he wins re-election? Will he survive until 2029 in, as president of the United States, in <laughs> seeming like he has, has some, some of his faculties? I, I'd say the odds are probably 50%. Uh, I, I would think that uh, the Democrats would encourage some, someone like uh, Gavin Newsom to run. I mean, Biden is not a particularly strong or appealing prospect. Right, back to this David Brooks article. And he, he talks about we live in this morally inarticulate world. But, I mean, that's not the world I see. I mean, progressives are telling you at every turn what you may or may not do, what you should and shouldn't eat, what you should and shouldn't smoke, where you should put your trash, your recyclables, your grass clippings, all for your own good. And this is from Ronnie Goodman's terrific work in progress, conservative claims of cultural oppression on the nature and origins of conservative phobia. So liberals the drop of a Rolodex and come at you with a rotating hit squad of well-placed academics ready to pounce and opine just about anything having to do with you. The liberals are people trained practically from birth as an instant response team. The weaklings and the physical cowards who sought the safety of a sinecure, meaning tenure, instead of the mortal combat of life, but is to get the, th still get the thrill of shooting inarticulate fish in a barrel. I think that's a pretty good description of the world that we're in right now. So we don't lack for moral articulation. Right, so if uh, conservatives are somehow primitive, as liberals accuse, if, if we're medieval, it's because our hero systems are less subtle. They may be tied around blood, maybe tied around soil, they may be tied around traditional understandings of the relationship of the human being to other people, to the tribe, to the nation, to, to the universe, and to, and to God. So left-wing hero systems tend to be a little more disguised, but this disguising is precisely the ethos of the disengaged, self-control, self-reflexivity. You can find all the meaning and purpose, right and wrong, morality that you need between your own two ears from the modern liberal perspective. So liberals essentially spiritualize all the impulses that they would prefer to associate with conservatives, and thereby they get to indulge in them under a veneer of sophistication. So you've got affirmative action, which serves as absolution ritual whereby white liberals beseech militant blacks to expiate America's original sin of racism. 
right? So in the area of race, Americans have been conditioned by the news media and our elites into a rigid and unforgiving propriety. I mean, is there any area where we are more restrained, tight-lipped, careful about what we say, uh, particularly in public, you know, careful that anything that, that we say that gets out of a very narrow band of acceptable opinion when it comes to race can absolutely blow up in our face. So, yes, since the 1950s, race has replaced sex as the primary focus of America's moral seriousness. So we don't lack for moral seriousness. It's just from a traditional point of view, the moral seriousness is completely misplaced. Right? There's nothing inherently immoral about uh, racism, sexism, Islamophobia, homophobia, and the like. These are usually reflections of a healthy sense of bondedness with your in-group rather than something immoral. So moral seriousness right, is kind of the mirror image of what liberals oppose with conservatives and their moral seriousness about sex. So liberals have all sorts of hang-ups, not so much with sex, but with any words about race that uh, go off the sanctioned path. Right, so we've got social justice is a secularized morality of sin and redemption. Any opinion that might so much as resonate with racists, such as opposition to affirmative action, is treated as violation of a sacred taboo, even when it's entirely defensible on non-racist grounds. So liberalism is its own hero system, its own sanctioned path, and what many people who identify with Christian nationalism are doing is they're simply revolting, revolting against this dominance of the liberal left of all our major institutions. So liberals have these vague premonitions of erosion unraveling by the slightest perceived softening of anti-racist inhibitions. So they think that, ah, oh, people will just you know, turn to bloodlust and uh, civil war if we let up on political correctness in any way. So conservatives and people on the right refuse to accept liberal race discourse at face value because they sense that this is just a sophisticated pretense. It's, it's an opportunity to, to indulge in ecstasies of intellectualized liberal shame. It's an invitation to bask in all sorts of primitive emotions that would be de decried as insophisticated and retrograde if expressed in less intellectual context on behalf of other causes. Now, as part of the growing rule by experts that we have in this country, we have all sorts of normal human emotions, such as preference for one's in-group, and uh, say preference for male-only spaces, or preferences for a heterosexual identification of for marriage, for a heterosexual military, all sorts of normal human emotions, primitive, primal emotions, preferences for, for particular blood and soil, they have been turned into pathologies. And one normal human emotion, sadness, has been also been turned into a pathology by our reigning elites, particularly in the psychiatric profession. And there was a terrific book published about this in 2007, The Loss of Sadness, How Psychiatry Transformed Normal Sorrow into Depressive Disorder. So whenever you experience a substantial loss, it would make sense that you would feel sad. You lose a friend, right? You lose an opportunity, you lose a dream, right? You, you lose a relationship, you lose a community, you, you lose a way of life, right? You lose, say, physical abilities, you're, you're reduced to, to bed by back pain. It would be completely normal for you to feel sad about that. But after several weeks of this, psychiatrists will diagnose you with a disorder, with, with depression. Thoughts on Elon Musk possibly banning the ADL? Well, the Anti-Defamation League is in large parts a, a left-wing ethnic lobby, and it wants to regulate and has been very successful at regulating what is acceptable speech on social media platforms and in public spaces around the world. So Elon Musk bought Twitter primarily for the basis of restoring freedom of speech on Twitter. It seems to me he's done a, a pretty good job overall. And so it's understandable that anyone who supports free speech in public spaces is going to be opposed to the Anti-Defamation League. Right, here's a little bit more on rule by experts. Uh, it, can, it can start grading on people. 
And for some, it has. Yes. And right. we know. We're aware. <laughs> Talking, that's uh, Dennis Prager, Julie Hartman, talking about how it grates on people when they talk about how much they love each other. Well, for those of you who don't know, th- this has actually preoccupied me. So very recently, and I'm sure all of you, certainly in the United States, are aware of the once in 80-something years, in other words, not since 1939 was there a tropical storm in Southern California, or maybe California. We, we don't get that. I mean, Florida gets it. The East Coast gets it. Other places. So... People, namely the National Weather Service, the state of California, the county of Los Angeles, it was like COVID. Schools were shut down. uh, uh, Government offices were shut down. People were warned constantly, stay home unless it is an emergency. This is life-threatening. I have have a picture of the notice on my phone. Well, I attended a wedding that weekend. The the warnings were for Sunday night. That Sunday night, I, I was to attend a wedding, which I did. The groom told me, and to his great credit, he was not engaged in self-pity, he just noted, 40 people. And I would say the entire number of people there was 100. Mm-hmm. So there would have been 140, 40 didn't, didn't come. Because of this hurricane. Right. So now what everybody listening and watching needs to understand is Sunday night it rained in Southern California. That's all it did. There were no winds. Not lightning. Okay, so rain is not equal in its effects everywhere in the United States. Southern California is not designed for large amounts of rain. So this rainfall was trivial compared to other areas of the country that are much more equipped for, for dealing with heavy rainfalls. So I'm, I'm ambivalent about this story. Did, was there too many warnings? Were the warnings too severe with regard to this tropical storm? I stayed in. I stayed in all Sunday. I saw enough video of people driving around and getting stuck and uh, you know, people having you know, horrific results on the roads. I, I stayed in. Uh, sometimes your own common sense is superior to that, what the expert meteorologists and the experts in you know, public safety tell you, and sometimes it's not. From, from what uh, my that, that's an interesting point, right. And regularly in Southern California, there are heavier rainstorms. It was just raining. That was the entirety. It, now, there were parts outside of L.A. County where people were knee-deep in water. That's also very common. Every, when there's a heavy rain, there's, there's some flooding. That's part of life. It's particularly part of life in Southern California because Southern California architecture and streets and communities are not designed for handling large amounts of rain. Okay, so this tropical storm brought about 30 times the amount of rainfall that had been previously recorded on this date as the highest amount of rainfall. So this was an extraordinary event. Uh, These warnings, it doesn't seem to me entirely delusional or misplaced to have issued them. So I was thinking... Oh, I was very angry at the 40 people who didn't come to their wedding. It's so sad for the bride and groom. I mean, God bless them for enjoying their day. Even if zero people show up, you're getting married. It's a, it's a. Okay, when you have rain for the first time in an area not designed for rain, right? Streets are particularly slick, right? It's particularly dangerous driving. So who knows how many lives were saved because of these expert warnings stay home? Sacred, beautiful thing. But that must have been difficult for them. I would be I would be sad and upset if 40 people, a large so percentage in show. I, I got to tell you, I would pay any one of them money, good money, to come on my show and explain why they didn't go to the wedding. Were most, well, in fairness to some, maybe they were flying and their their flights were canceled or something, but was do you think no, it was no, primarily no, they local? No, 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 they were in LA. Oh, okay. No, 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 and some had already arrived the day earlier. Nobody flew in that day. Right. That's, and the flights were not there was no reason to cancel the flight. Nothing not everybody is equally comfortable driving in the rain, particularly in Southern California where it's rare and where you haven't had rain for six months, right? Roads are particularly slick and perilous. You get flush flooding because when the ground is especially dry, water travels across the surface, notes the chat, instead of being easily absorbed. You also get mudslides, liquefaction. You get all sorts of troubles. So Dennis Prager is doing what you need to do to be interesting as a pundit, like to make a very strong point. And I guess I'm not such a great pundit because I don't have a strong point here. I, I, have, I have equal sympathy for both perspectives. Happened. That's true. I, was, I, I actually was going to visit my sister on, on Sunday. She lives near LAX, and I was watching planes take off and land in the, in the rain. Flights were, were resume, resuming. They, they're, they're, resuming they is not even the right word. They, they were going off. Yeah, resuming is fine. They, they were never paused. Oh, yeah, that's correct. So it's not the correct word. Okay. I was trying to bail you out. I know. Thank you. I appreciate it. I know you do. Uh, they closed the schools. I know. That's absurd. How many parents will complain? Well, you said on your radio show 1%. I would agree, but 
I actually think a lot more would write emails if they didn't think that they or their children would be penalized for doing so. I think that a lot. So in the past, uh, Dennis has mocked you know, various places that are shut down in advance of possible hurricanes. But then you, and usually, usually the mocker is going to turn out to be right because the people who issue the warnings, right, they do it, I would expect, on the basis that if they're just right 10% of the time, all right, it, it, they would do more good than harm with these kind of warnings. Then sometimes you get things like Hurricane Katrina, right, which, which cause you know, substantial loss of life. And uh, you, you can't still perfectly accurately predict the weather and its effects on people. So warnings, you know, be alert, be on guard, don't seem entirely misplaced. A lot of parents would fear that they would be labeled as climate change deniers, complainers, not trusting of, you know, the government and its supreme wisdom. And Brandon says what's important about this is the government won't allow people to take risks. Well, the government is not stopping people from driving. Right? The government is not usually going door to door and, and forcing people to leave their homes. So in this case, with regard to the tropical storm hitting Los Angeles, the government took no punitive measures with, with the rarest of exceptions. I mean, you are perfectly free to drive around. Um, and authority, you know, uh, these parents would be seen as being hard on teachers who may not have access to transportation to get to schools. I mean, that's honestly what I think would prevent the parent more than anything else from sending an email to the school. And Glib Medley says most Angelinos self combust at the first drop of rain. Well, for, for good reason, because rain is more rare here. It's a more hazardous condition because Southern California is not built for handling significant amounts of rainfall, significant amounts of rainfall. Uh, far more dangerous here than they are in other parts of the country. And because people are not used to driving in rain and in driving in slippery, oily, uh, hazardous conditions, right, it's going to have much more of a negative effect. We are all tend to be anxious about things that we have less familiarity with compared to people who have a great deal of familiarity. And that's, that's a whole problem unto its own. Yes, uh, that is. So my very, very dark conclusion is one I wrote about. I actually read it on my radio show. You read my book, Think a Second Time, my book of essays? Of course, yes. I've read all your books. Yeah, you did. Okay. Except Deuteronomy. But Except Deuteronomy. Yeah, I haven't yeah. read that okay. yet. So I, I have an essay in there. I mean, it, I'm very proud of this fact because I wrote this in the late 1990s, a long time ago. And I wrote an essay about a an experience I had. In a nutshell, I, I was to give a speech in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, which is on out, a suburb of Philadelphia. And I, so I arrived the day before in, in New York City, stayed overnight at a hotel in Manhattan, had a rental car all night. And when I woke up, do not drive blizzard storm conditions. Unless it is an emergency, do not drive. I looked out the window of my hotel room. I remember this so vividly. And it looked to me like there was about one inch of snow on the ground. <laughs> so I remember thinking, because I still had not yet realized what I now realize, people are so influenced by media that it is more influential than their own experience. Yes. This is critical. This is why it's so dark. So I thought, oh, well, I, I guess it's in New Jersey. It's horrible. Of course, it was a stupid comment, because how far is Manhattan from New Jersey? It, you know, one of the tunnels or the, or the George Washington Bridge. So I left three hours early, and I got there three hours early. There was no traffic. Everybody listened to the radio and TV. Mm -hmm. And that awakened me to the ease with which people can be brainwashed. Yes. You are experiencing the opposite of what we're saying, and you believe us. Well, that. Well, sometimes what you don't see, but the experts do see as a possible ha hazard, right? Sometimes what you don't see is a hazard, right? It's not like your own intuitions are just 95% of the time superior to that of those with expertise in the area, right? I'd say it's about 50 50. That's the comment that I made. I remember on Dennis and Julie while I was still in college. It's I remember one day walking in Harvard Yard and this hit me like a lightning bolt, um, a real one, not a government fake one that may or may not have occurred during a fake hurricane. Anyway, I, I remember walking in the yard and going, what people are fighting against, what occupies so much of their time, the money that goes to grants and research projects and, and, and theses at this university doesn't exist. Race, I mean, not that, I shouldn't say doesn't exist, obviously. Right, Small yes. amounts of racism yes. in the United States exist. Right. Climate change does exist. Is it the existential? But, but think about that. This whole complex of, of thought and money and energy and time, and it is given to these boogeymen that aren't real. The, the, the average student at the American college or university who says that they are fighting against racism has never seen it before a day in their life. Well, for someone who's not a believer, it's not real.
all right, if you're not a Christian, all right, many of the things that Christians sense around them, all right, the presence of evil spirits or the presence of the Lord, all right, it's not going to be real to you. If you don't believe in the left-wing value system, then, yeah, the, the presence of racism is going to seem bogus. Lives. Isn't that amazing? And so you're right. It, people can be brainwashed so easily. Against what they see. Against what they see. Or, I mean, in the case of racism, don't see. Racism is totally rampant. I've never seen it. Wouldn't you think if, if the United States were as systemically racist a place as the left makes it out to be, don't you think we would have met one racist in our lifetime? I have never met a racist in my entire life. Well, I've Literally lived a not lot one. longer than you. The only one I knew was my, my grandpa. I know. You told that on, on the air. Which was somewhat of a joke. Right. Because he treated, you said yes. he treated black people yes. beautifully. Right. I have. Okay. Back to this uh, David Brooks essay on uh, you know, what, what's going on with, with America? And part of what's going on with America is that uh, a great deal of ordinary, healthy, primal, primitive, medieval emotions and responses, such as the blood and the soil, loyalty to a particular people, a desire for a heterosexual understanding of marriage and of the military, all right, freedom of association, rights to private property, the original understandings of the U.S. Constitution prior to the civil rights industrial complex launched in the 1960s, all right, many of these things have become pathologized. And so there's a terrific book about one aspect of this, the loss of sadness, right? How psychiatry transformed normal sorrow into a depressive disorder, right? Grief is a normal, natural, and often healthy reaction to loss, the end of a love affair, finding out that your spouse has been unfaithful, the dissolution of a marriage, the failure to achieve your cherished life goals, the loss of financial resources, the loss of illusions, right? You, you may go to work thinking you have excellent relations with people, and then you, you, you may find out they've been stabbing you in the back. The loss of social supports and relationships, the diagnosis of a serious illness in yourself or a loved one, the death of a beloved pet, the death of a celebrity who you do not personally know, all these things can create periods of low mood, low initiative, and pessimism. This is a normal, healthy, natural reaction to loss. My father was devastated with Ingmar. Is it Ingmar? Not the director, the, the actress. Yeah, no, no. Ingrid, but is it Ingrid Bergman? Ingrid Bergman. Yes, my father was devastated with Ingrid Bergman uh, died. He, he took that very hard. He just absolutely adored her. So the... DSM, Diagnostic Statistical Manual for Psychiatry, they have a definition of a mental disorder that uh, excludes all expected and culturally sanctioned responses to a particular event, for example, the death of a loved one. So they exclude that from its definition of a mental disorder. But emotionally painful responses to other loss, such as losses of illusions, losses of uh, opportunities, marital, romantic health, or financial losses, can be just as expected and culturally sanctioned responses as those of bereavement and should therefore fall under the definition's exclusion as well. So marital dissolution is probably the most common trigger of intense normal sadness that could meet the DSM's symptomatic criteria for a depressive disorder. Right? The intense sadness that follows the loss of romantic attachments is a long literary theme. So severe losses of an intimate nature inevitably lead to a sadness response. This is not necessarily a depressive disorder that needs to be treated with medication. So we all live in evolutionary mismatch, right? We are largely shaped by genes that developed as an adaptation to previous environments, all right? We are prehistoric creatures living in medieval institutions with godlike technology. I love that summary. And Alan Horwitz wrote another terrific book from 2016, What's Normal? Reconciling Biology and Culture. So contemporary societies are the safest, the healthiest, the most prosperous that have ever existed. So you would expect their citizens would have low levels of fear and anxiety. I mean, is this not one of the most central accomplishments of modern civilization? The overall reduction of a rational basis for fear because we have nighttime electrical lighting, we have insurance policies, we have police forces, we have standing armies, we have the destruction of predatory animals, we have lightning rods on churches, we have solid locked doors on buildings. Right? We have thousands of other small designs making life much safer. Rates of violence are around the lowest they've been in recorded history. Lifespans of unprecedented longevity mean that few of us need to fear dying before old age. We have greater economic security than previous eras, and yet our own current age 
reveals extraordinary high rates of anxiety. So why is this and why is it called a disorder? So perhaps the best reason is evolutionary mismatch, just like our preferences for high calorie foods, right? Our current fears do not correspond to actual dangers in present situations, but they are better understandable as reactions that were passed down to us as part of our biological inheritance of fears that made more sense in the prehistoric past where we evolved. Uh, infants display a great deal of social anxiety. Fear of strangers is virtually universal, seems to be biologically primed. The temptation to see anyone who's different from us as hostile and subhuman is always present in us, right? Maybe deeply buried, maybe deeply repressed, it may be disdained, it may be put down, it may be pathologized, you may have whole armies of social workers and mental health professionals and liberal elites condemning any manifestation of this, but it's in all of us, right? All of us have this temptation to see anyone who's different from us as hostile and subhuman. It is always present in us, no matter how deeply buried. We do not tend to be promiscuous because people are naturally jealous when their relationship is threatened by a partner's additional sexual involvement. So jealousy functions to protect monogamy, to deter infidelity, and to signal a potentially adulterous partner that he should refrain from entering a relationship. So jealousy has acted as the glue that holds the sexes together for the benefit of the family and the survival of the species. This is a primitive emotion. This is a primal emotion. It's a medieval emotion. One that uh, our more modern elites may think they can transcend. But jealousy is innate, the human condition. So we have emotions because they are adaptive, right? Normal grief, normal sadness has three essential components. It usually arises in a specific context after the death of an intimate or some substantial loss. Its intensity should be roughly proportionate to the importance and centrality to one's life of the loss. And it should gradually subside over time as people adjust to their new circumstances and return to psychological and social equilibrium. Now, grief can be pathological just like a risk can be pathological when it can't do the things you expect a risk to do. So grief processes become pathological when they emerge in inappropriate circumstances, when you have extreme symptoms that do not match circumstance, you have functional impairment, where you have morbid preoccupations, suicidal ideation, psychotic symptoms that persist for an extraordinary long period of time. And another bedrock evolutionary principle that uh, Darwin never mentions, he just takes it for granted, is heterosexuality. That one, that one never mentioned same-sex erotic behavior. So I was listening to this decoding the essays, uh, decoding the gurus episode on Noam Chomsky, and I was thinking, Noam Chomsky here sounds so much like Donald Trump after the 2020 election. Noam Chomsky here talking about how Labor came reasonably close to winning, right? Uh, fell about 18 votes, 18 parliament members short of taking power in 2017. And Noam Chomsky in this interview just talks about it as a great victory. It sounds uh, very much like how Donald Trump would talk. Countries like Britain and America break away from the, as you put it, Western party line. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, I think, just agreed with you on lots of things, actually, in, in politics. He, he went to the country twice and he lost twice. It turns out the country did not want Jeremy Corbyn to be prime minister. Well, you know perfectly well that that's not what happened. Jeremy Corbyn won an enormous victory in 2017. Okay, <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn, right, who's the Labour, leader of Britain's Labour Party in 2017, won a tremendous victory in 2017. Now, he didn't win enough of a victory in the sense that he got more seats and was able to form a government and take power. But, I mean, this is what happens when you operate with partisan blindness. And it's just as true of Donald Trump and his supporters as it is true of people on the left like Noam Chomsky. 17. No, he didn't. Yes. The biggest victory that Labour had won in a generation. No, he wasn't. He lost. He didn't become Prime Minister. Then what happened is the British establishment, including your newspaper, came down on him with a ton of bricks with false, deceitful propaganda about uh, anti-Semitism, all exposed as lies. Totally. That's just not true. I'm afraid that's just not true. Uh, facts check this for us, Chris. Uh, he won. <laughs> what happened with this election? Why is Chomsky saying that um, Corbyn won it? So objectively, Corbyn lost. Labour has not, has not been in power for quite a long time in the UK. So what he's referring to 
is that compared to their performance in 2015, they won a large amount of seats. So it was like a positive swing. Under Ed Miliband, they won 232 seats in 2015. Right, so Ed Miliband lost as well. <laughs> but, but then when Jeremy Corbyn was leader two years later, Labour won 30 extra seats, a 12.9% increase from their previous seats, which was quite large. However, that was not large enough to stop the Conservatives from winning the majority. So Tony Blair, in comparison, in 1997, won 418 seats, right? Mm -hmm. Or in 2001, 413. In 2005, 355. All of which put Labour into power. So Tony Blair's performance objectively better than Jeremy Corbyn's. From yeah. 1990 election onwards, Corbyn's was the fourth best performance after Tony Blair. But what Chomsky is talking about is one, that swing, because people expected Corbyn to do worse. And there was a positive swing. But the other aspect is that the population of the UK has increased from the 90s. So if you count it by the amount of people that voted for oh. Labour, it's more. <laughs> right? But this feels to mention that two years later, I mean, this is the exact type of argument that Trump supporters were making, that Trump received more votes than any other incumbent president. How come he wasn't lawfully re-elected? Well, receiving more votes than any other incumbent president does not get you elected. What happens is you have to receive more electoral votes from the Electoral College than the person that, and party that you're running against, which Trump failed to do. But Noam Chomsky here is just echoing the same sort of rhetoric used by Donald Trump and his supporters. In 2019, Labour lost 60 seats under Jeremy Corbyn and failed to win election again. Okay. So, All right. so you're being a stickler yeah. for facts, and that's helpful. That's good. That's useful. Thank you, Chris. But getting back to the question, the question that was asked is basically, if you're so right, Noam Chomsky, if, if all the working people in the UK are horribly exploited and desperately want this sort of change, then how come they aren't voting for it? And I think Chomsky's answer would be, that's because they're being tricked. Well, first of all, he kind of avoids the question by misrepresenting the facts as you describe them. But I think if he was pushed, he would say that they were being seduced and deceived by the mainstream media complex, which is tricking them to vote against their interests. Yeah. Right. And that's what many people on the right complain. Oh, the, the Democrats control the media, which they do. They control almost all our major institutions, which they do. So people are being track, tricked against voting in their self-interest. And this doesn't hold up because we are not evolutionarily adapted to being gullible. All right. So even though the Democrats control almost all our major institutions, Republicans still stand a very solid chance of winning even the presidential election, because people don't just take cues from elites or from their education and from the media and just allow that to overwhelm all their own imperatives, right? The, the democratic control of all our major institutions may account for, say, up to 1% of uh, you know, voting patterns, but uh, even that, I think, is considerably exaggerated. Right, back to Noam Chomsky echoing Trumpist type rhetoric. Yes, and he was asked by a different, more sympathetic interviewer about that question. Like, why did you say that? And you can hear his response to um, why he described that. And it is basically what you're saying. Uh, you recently claimed that Jeremy Corbyn had a historic victory in 2017. Why do you think it's important to recognize that result and describe it in those terms? Well, Jeremy Corbyn is a very decent... Elliot Blatt says the Burning Man flood is the feel-good story of 2023. Why? Why does that feel good? Like, what do you have against Burning Man? Why are you taking joy in other people's suffering? Elliot Blatt, is it because you weren't invited? Why? I mean, this is like the time I, I went to an engagement party and showed up in therapy the next day, and I talked about these two, two women who squealed in delight when they saw each other, and they ran into each other's hand, arms, and then they jumped up and down. And I was talking about how silly that was. My therapist said, well, don't you wish that someone would squeal with delight when they see you and run across the, the room and, and embrace you? And I thought, oh, yeah, I, I, I guess I do. In person, I tried to create a labor party that would be a participatory party, not just run by elites and, and the parliament, and it would furthermore work for the interests of its constituents. I mean, this sounds exactly like Donald Trump and his supporters, all right? Finally, we've got someone who bypasses the elites and is trying to organize and run government in the interests of the people rather than the elites. I mean, this is a real meeting of the left and right. Uh, and was very successful. 2017 vote uh, increased the labor vote by huge amounts, I think more than in about 50 years. Now that set off alarm bells through the whole establishment. Can't allow this. 
We can't have a political party that's a participatory party. Right. This is how Trump has talked, that uh, Donald Trump sets off alarm bells among the establishment or immigration restrictionists. They set off alarm bells among the establishment and the elites decide we simply can't have this kind of talk. Right. This is an exact match for right wing dissident rhetoric, but it's coming from a left wing dissident. But it's the same type of partisan thinking. Party and that represents its constituents. It's not the way politics works. Politics works run by small elites who tell everyone. You should decode anti gentilism. Yes, well, anyone with a strong in group identity is very likely to harbor negative feelings about out groups. Like we all have within us a propensity to regard people who are different from us as subhuman. As I mentioned earlier, this may be very deep, it may be strongly repressed, it may be something you only offer in, in the most private of uh, circumstances, but it's there within us, it's there just as much within Jews as among non-Jews, right? We all have a tendency deep within us to have great suspicion, opprobrium, disgust, and revulsion towards people who are different from us. Anyone else what to do? Then came the establishment attack on uh, You should do a decoding of Jewish hate for Christianity. Well, it would be weird if two groups who had so much tension, conflict between them, who have exchanged so much violent rhetoric, right, who have persecuted each other, though Christians have obviously had far more state power than Jews over the past 2,000 years, it would be very weird if there wasn't some negative feelings flowing in both directions. So Christianity emerged out of Judaism, right? It, it would be weird if, uh, if Christians didn't have some negative feelings about Jews for not accepting Christian claims for, for Christ. And it would be very weird if Jews didn't have negative feelings about Christians. After all, when Christians were in power, right, they persecuted Jews at times. Uh, at times they forcibly converted Jews. At times they killed Jews. Now, it's very easy for Jews to be self-righteous about this because they very rarely had uh, state power over Christians, but both groups, it's easy for them to find reasons to have disdain, even hatred for the other, in addition to more complicated emotions and positive emotions. So until the 18th century, Jewish fortunes and Christian fortunes were running, generally speaking, in opposite directions. So the stronger Christianity was, the, the weaker Jews were. After the 18th century, with the rise of secularism, uh, Jewish and, and Christian uh, forces have largely run in, in tandem. As we increasingly live in a secular world, uh, religious Christians, religious Jews increasingly find more in common. But uh, back to Noam Chomsky. And Corbin, which was impressive, concocting all kinds of tales about anti-Semitism, all exploded, even in the early days, uh, at the beginning of this campaign, uh, Chris, maybe it's all the mention. So why would people use accusations of anti-Semitism to take down someone like Jeremy Corbyn? Uh, if it's effective, people reach for whatever's effective. They'll use someone of plagiarism, right? That's the, probably the most damaging accusation you can ever make against a writer. You accuse them of plagiarism. That's like the death knell for a writer's career. Uh, but if, if anti-Semitism will get the job done, then you'll use anti-Semitism. If uh, racism will get the job done or homophobia, I mean, we all have an instinctive feel for which accusations will be most damaging, right? If you're a woman at work and you have some negative feelings about the workplace, all right, you can destroy a man's career. You can get him fired by making accusations against the man that may not be entirely fair and accurate, right? Uh, so we all tend to reach for, for whichever attack is going to be most effective. ...of the elites stealing the legitimate outcome of the election, but it does remind me of Trump's talk about stolen elections and illegitimate election outcomes. It's, it's kind of like the left-wing version of it, isn't it? Like the right-wing version of these sorts of slightly conspiratorial things is very concrete. They rig the ballot boxes, they stole the election, that kind of thing. The left-wing version is always a bit more abstract, right? And not so concrete. It's, not it's, always abstract. Like in left-wing socialist countries, they very much just openly say, you know, the ballot boxes have been tampered with or whatever, if they're in power and able to do so, if the result goes against them. So I, yeah. I don't think it's always the case that it's couched so non-concretely, shall we say. But in, in this case, yes, I agree. First of all, you know, you could hear there, Matt, right? Because he said the biggest increase in 50 years. So it's trying to present it in that relative way, which again, it's completely wrong because <laughs> there was an increase of 147 seats in 1997, a 54% increase. So that's just factually wrong. But, but even setting that aside, 
there's the notion that the will of the people would elect the leader that Chomsky wants if the people were allowed to express it. And obviously the objection to Corbyn, any of the kind of reasons given are fundamentally dishonest. It's because of the threat he poses to capital. Yeah, and form forming a properly inclusive labor movement. That's the, that's the real threat. Yeah, it, Corbyn is a decent man who wants to create a utopian society and the evil neoliberal capitalists cannot allow that, so they have to disarm. Now, and Trump supporters would say <laughs> much the same thing about evil, evil neoliberal you know, capitalists who won't allow you know, an America first regime to get the job done. Like, looking back to this David Brooks essay in The Atlantic about moral formation. So David Brooks writes that uh, we live in a society that's terrible at moral formation. Well, what is your starting point for understanding moral formation? Right, for the liberal, people are primarily individuals with certain inalienable rights who can decide meaning and right and wrong by their own brains. For conservatives, people are primarily members of families, tribes, and nations with at least as many responsibilities as rights. So which perspective do you think would be more effective at moral formation? Now, Jonathan Haidt wrote a book called The Righteous Mind. He says that our understandings of fear, fairness, and justice elab develop from evolution, from a long history of alliance, formation, and cooperation among unrelated individuals in many primate species. And that led to the evolution of a whole series of emotions that motivate altruism, including anger, guilt, and gratitude. These all promote the reciprocity and non-zero-sum alliances that uh, social primates need to survive. Liberty and oppression is also an evolutionary solution to the problem of social cooperation. So we evolve certain responses to the adaptive challenge of living in small groups with individuals who would, if given the chance, dominate, bully, and constrain others. So aggressive domineering behavior by an alpha male or female can trigger this foundation listening the righteous anger necessary to mobilize the group against would-be bullies. So Donald Trump has many of these characteristics of the bully, right? He t can be aggressive, domineering, and he has triggered a response that is probably rooted in our evolutionary instincts. So another major difference between the left and the right, between, say, Christian nationalists on the right and anti-Christian nationalists on the left, that people on the left place far more faith in experts. Uh, the, the PhDs who know better, who plan, who exhort, who badger and scold us. Right? They idealize the action intellectuals who have that special knowledge on how to fix society's problems. So the conservative intellectual disavows those ambitions. He uses his powers not to badger and scold the American people, but to expose the liberal badgering and scolding for what it is, for a form of liberal elitism, one more arena in which the anointed can mock, scold, and intimidated the benighted under the deceptive of veneer of enlightenment, progress, and liberation. So all this all-purpose benevolence that the nurturant parent liberal morality invites is just resulting in endless manipulation and intrusiveness, but it's all cloaked in the mantle of respect for the individual's highest potential. But this respect is merely another tool with which the liberal left elite badger and scold those people on the right who they regard as benighted. It's a cudgel used to underscore the deficiencies of those who have not attained liberalism's self-understanding of having a higher consciousness. So when will somewhat display a moderately adequate level of curiosity how broad-minded must be? be? Well, anyone who's found lacking on these fronts falls short of the high standards that liberals in their optimism urge upon us. So the ecumenical open-mindedness of liberal values really means that they can be implemented to fit their own parochial partisan imperatives, right? They disguise their policies with lofty abstractions such as awareness and sensitivities because they can never openly announce their hero system. So David Brooks defines moral formation as comprised of three things, helping people learn to restrain their selfishness, teaching basic social and ethical skills, and helping people find a purpose in life. Well, where do people normally get these skills? You get them from within the family, the extended family, the community, the tribe, the church, or the synagogue. Right? Where do we get our cues from what is good and noble and worthy of pursuing in life? Right, so liberals, particularly among the elites, they, they believe they stand above you know, this primitive retrograde medieval conservatism 
because they believe that their enlightenment ideals, belief in the power of rationality, belief in the innate human goodness, liberate them from the primitive, in their eyes, hero systems to which people on the right remain beholden, hero systems that revolve around loyalty to family, to blood, to soil, right, to a particular religion, to a particular nation. All right, so a hero system is a social teleology. Teleology means ultimate ends. It's a system of collective meaning production. And liberals see conservatives as compromised by a primitive attraction to these relics of a benighted medieval worldview. So one way of understanding differences between people on the right and the left is that people on the right are more medieval than people on the left who regard themselves as much more modern. The left-wing hero system tends to be disguised. It's concealed behind a secular facade of enlightenment, pragmatism, and utilitarianism. The liberals see themselves as promoting ordinary human fulfillment, shorn of any higher religious or metaphysical aspirations. But people on the right see that this liberalism, unbeknownst to itself, is motivated by a religious impulse and spiritual ideal that's become secularized, and it plays itself out through the medium of ostensibly secular goals, such as stopping global warming, ending racism, ending poverty. So liberalism is a hero system that disguises itself as the transcendence of all hero systems. On the other hand, it is the case that there, of course, there are right-wing smear campaigns against a liberal leader in the run-up of the election. The right-wing tabloids are obviously going to portray a left-wing leader in the least favorable light they can. So yeah, there are a lot of parallels that I think people won't want to have emphasized, but the underlying logic is the same. And I, I have more clips <laughs> which uh, <laughs> illustrate that. And so maybe I can move on to another one. Let's go back to the facts. 2017, he lost. He won the big. He lost. He lost. Sorry, there was the biggest labor <laughs> in history. Then came the. It was, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. He lost. Then, uh, it was the biggest labor gain in history. Then on came, what ground? On what, no, it wasn't. On what basis was it? Then came the enormous establishment attack across the board, right to left, so it's called Left Guardian, with deceitful lies, all since exposed, about charges of anti-Semitism. No, that's not true. I'm sorry. The, the Equality and Human Rights Commission in the UK, the watchdog set up by the Labour Party, found the Labour Party guilty of not protecting Jews within the party. Less anti-Semitism in the Labour Party than among the Tories. This has all been exposed in detail by the Labour files. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, he does seem to have a very clear narrative there about Jeremy Corbyn winning, um, winning with a capital yeah. W. Uh, <laughs> but not, like, the thing is, he's not insane. Like, he knows that he didn't actually win. Like, mm. So it's just the technical definition of winning that he wants to insert. But it, it's quite impressive how hard it is to knock him off track. <laughs> yes, it's like a steamroller. The interjections and disagreements just bouncing off him. Uh, yeah, so I guess... But, What's the theme there? The theme there is that for him, for his worldview, it has to be the case that grassroots working class movement, as exemplified by Jeremy Corbyn, can basically do no wrong. And if they don't win general elections, then it's because of lies, media manipulation, false class consciousness or something like that. Right. I mean, this is the same sort of rhetoric that's used by Trump supporters and people all over the political spectrum. Right. In uh, the United Kingdom, a major TV news presenter has been socially ostracized because, what, he was uh, ha paying off and having sexual relationships with the uh, young men who work for him. Let's see what Douglas you Murray has to say. getting clogged up by these sorts of, you know, cake gate, speed gate, everything's a damn gate, you know, and everyone thinks it's so original when they put gate after anything. Um, and, uh, you know, what would the government be concentrating on? What, what might it be achieving? Um, if the answer is not much more, then there's even more trouble that we're in than I thought. Uh, but, my, but my belief is, is that we, we just are horribly misdirecting our, our energies. And yes, uh, there's, there's doubtless scandals going on. There always are. Um, and there are scandals that are of significance. I mean, you just mentioned Northern Ireland. The steak knife controversy has come back up again. I don't think that outside of Northern Ireland, one in a thousand households know anything about that. Maybe they don't need to. But it would probably be a more intelligent scandal to look at than the Gordon the Gophers former sofa mate scandal. Um, I, I, I think that, but as I say, the, the main thing isn't, isn't, you know, where are the scandals? It's a very post Watergate thing that, that, that journalists think that their job is to find all the scandals that exist, expose them and then win all of the awards. It's, it's a very, it's a very sort of post Watergate way of doing journalism. Sometimes there are scandals, then they should be exposed. But the, the whole of politics, the whole of the country isn't just a set of scandals waiting to be uncovered. Right. The, the biggest problems we face are not scandals. The biggest problems we face 
are the results of laws and directions given by elites, such as to not you know, have police do their jobs, such as to pull people over for reckless driving and for not punishing violent criminals, right? This has all been done with the full consent of the law. There is some fundamental failure of the media in this, but the fundamental failure of the media is a fundamental failure of government. It's a reflection of that, which is the, the fact that government seems not to be able to do in Britain any of the things that we need it to do. Have... There is some fundamental failure of the media in this. But... Okay. We, we are risking throwing Philip Schofield under the bus. Now, I do think what he did was wrong. He knows what he did was wrong. He was clearly in a position of power. Uh, he And I, I think the biggest issue is the, his connections in getting this young one at his job at ITV, because it was clearly that's what got him to that position. So we, we know this was a young person who was enamored by Philip Schofield, and that power dynamic was very toxic. However, we have to remember that, you know, at some point there's going to be a situation of, you know, vultures circling the prey here. Mm -hmm. He has come out, he has said he, he, he was wrong and he lied and all of that. I think we have to remember that he's still a human being and yeah. it's this kind of bullying that took took out Caroline Flack. Now, he, he his mental health must be under enormous amount of strain because while he was wrong, you know, he's lost so much. He's lost, you know, the, his, the credibility that he's built over a 30-year career. He's no longer hosting that award show, which named Escape Me. 